So I was asked to talk about biotechnology and its impact on medicine. But first I want to spend a couple minutes on biotech itself. So why is this the transformative technology of the 20th century? Well, quite frankly, it's the most advanced manufacturing system on Earth. If you think about it, it creates everything from a coral reef to a redwood tree to a human using simple chemical ingredients and a DNA code. And in the past 50 years, we've gone from not really understanding the process to being able to edit it and in some cases being able to create it ourselves. This has resulted in an acceleration in progress unlike anything that we've seen before. And I believe we are truly living in an age of miracles and that these miracles need to be shared across the entire population of the Earth. I was invited to a meeting at the United Nations to talk about biotech and the sustainable development goals. And they asked me to name the top 10 areas of progress in biotech. And it was remarkably easy because there's a lot going on. Reading and writing DNA code has gotten cheaper than ever before. Uh, you may have seen this graph where it's outstripping Moore's law uh, in terms of reading DNA code. And the result of this is uh, just a tremendous amount of progress in medicine that, uh, for example, um, allows us to do personalized medicine. Uh, we're looking at not only a person's genomics, but their microbiome, the organisms that live in them and on them. Uh, many other features are able to be cataloged and used to design the best therapies. We're also learning a lot more about how organisms work, what sort of biochemical pathways run the cell, the architecture of it, and creating minimal cells where we delete genes and see which ones are important will eventually lead to uh, maybe a computer simulation of a cell where we can actually predict what's going on with accuracy. All of the technologies are coming together sort of at the same time. So we have massive amounts of data collection. We have massive amounts of data storage. We have massive amounts of um, data being analyzed through algorithms through artificial intelligence. And it's like everything is coming together in this current moment, and of course fueled by the fact that information flies around the globe at an unprecedented rate. New technologies are coming online to edit genomes. We'll hear more about CRISPR from Jennifer Kahn. And for the first time, we're faced with a lot of science fiction-like scenarios that were always 10 years in the future. So the ability to actually edit a human embryo um, the first experiments were done just this past summer, and it opens up a whole can of worms in terms of how this technology should be regulated, uh, who gets to choose who has access to it, and a host of other things. So you're probably all familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals at the United Nations. Biotech, I think, has great promise in the areas of food security, in the areas of energy, and of course, healthcare. But we really have to look at both sides of it because any sufficiently advanced technology always is dual use. And so for every spurt in economic growth, there's a potential for disruption because uh, of certain nations or peoples having it and other people not having access to it that creates political instability. You also have uh, the, the potential to help um, ecosystem disasters through this technology and at the same time potentially create ecosystem disasters. So how can we ensure that this technology is used for the good of humankind and the planet? And that's where I think governments have to play a critical role. So, Certain governments are looking into this. The problem is the technology, the progress in it is outstripping the ability to create legislation. The technology is moving faster than governments are in trying to regulate it. Um, the problem is being recognized, which is good, but it also has to be addressed. And we also have to make sure that there is participation by all groups who might be affected by this technology. Um, Jennifer Kahn is gonna talk about CRISPR in more detail, and 
there are certain aspects of that technology that if you deploy them, you're essentially deploying them for the Earth. You can't contain them. So uh, the United Nations has started to recognize certain things like that and, and address them. But again, who actually has the power to control that? Who has the right to deploy it? Um, these are all questions that are not easy to answer. There are no easy answers, but we should start thinking about them. I myself am working at a very local level to democratize biotech. I'm part of what's called the biohacker movement. <laughs> I started out uh, in a traditional career as a molecular biologist, and I found myself about 10 years ago being attracted to the idea that we could democratize this technology or at least get everybody to participate in it in some hands-on way in order to get people to understand it better because I felt that all of this progress in a lot of, a lot of circles is completely unknown. It, it's, not, it's not generally known in certain communities that the ability to edit a human embryo exists. So how can the discussion happen if number one, people aren't aware of it, and number two, they're scared of it? because they don't understand it and it's a technology that's being imposed upon them by somebody who is supposedly the expert. So I decided to create the world's first community laboratory. This is a nonprofit that's a standalone lab that's not affiliated with a university or a company. And basically, I teach genetic engineering to anyone who comes in off the street. Now, I know that sounds a little scary, but what I actually mean by that is I teach classes in not only how to do the stuff, but what the implications of it are. So hand in hand with the technical knowledge always has to come the contextualizing of it within society. And I think these community labs are great places to do that because it's a level playing field. It's not the typical environment of a scientist where you're behind the walls of a university or you're talking from some lofty ivory tower. It's a, it's a much more local, community-friendly interaction. So anything from a question of should I get the flu vaccine, is it dangerous, to, um, well, are GMOs bad, uh, can be addressed in, in, in a very, I don't know, um, not casual, but a very natural way. So briefly, the sorts of things that happen in these labs, and my lab, uh, my original lab, GenSpace, was used as a model. There are now these labs springing up uh, in many different countries. There are certainly several in the United States, but uh, Europe, um, Asia. We teach classes. We have mainly recycled equipment or equipment that we've gotten off eBay or has been donated to us. Uh, we try to reach the public through many different means. Uh, certainly, painting with fluorescent bacteria is an activity that doesn't seem really scary or dangerous, but it's a great entree into talking about not only bacteria and the microbiome, but about genetically modified bacteria and what sort of products they pr can produce for medicine and industry. Uh, it's also great to foster artists within these spaces that can comment on the technology. This is the work of an artist named Heather Dewey Hagborg, who took samples from the New York City streets of things like chewing gum and cigarette butts, extracted DNA, and used some of the information that we know about uh, genes that code for appearance and ancestry, and made portraits of people she'd never seen. And the fact that you see a piece of chewing gum and then a 3D face was, uh, I think it did more to um, get people aware of genomic privacy and all of the uh, sticky situations that might happen because your genome is essentially lying in every piece of hair that you lose than me talking for 20 minutes about it. A chewing gum in a face is pretty visceral. How do we keep innovation going, though, but keep it responsible? If we have this sort of distributed research and Quite frankly, even distributed manufacturing, uh, the, uh, the, the kind of furor at some of the drug prices these days has spawned some efforts by these communities to do things like figure out alternate ways to synthesize life-saving biopharmaceuticals 
or pr 3D print an EpiPen. And these activities are right now completely unregulated because they're not being sold to anyone. So how do we foster responsible innovation? Well, the community can come together. This was a meeting at MIT this year of the so-called biohacker or citizen science community. And we do get together and have ethical discussions about this stuff. Uh, but at the moment, there are no overarching regulations, nor are we sure that we need that sort of thing unless it's quite flexible. Because we don't want to stifle innovation and creativity in these spaces. And quite frankly, they're great for early proof of concept experiments. How can we expedite the access to other countries as well? So if we have an inequality not only between citizens in one country, but between different countries, what's the best route uh, to jumpstart innovation in a country that doesn't have infrastructure? Well, my feeling is that it starts with the youth of that country. And so my efforts in the United States have been with youth in underserved communities, uh, kids that are in local public high schools that don't have facilities, that are sometimes of ethnic groups that are underrepresented in science. And we've done a few internship programs like this and we're expanding to also uh, include the teachers. Another great program is iGEM, the International Genetically Modified Machine Competition. And that is a program that is uh, started at MIT and is now a worldwide genetic engineering competition with thousands of kids that participate every year. And it's really bringing that idea of uh, um, innovating with biotechnology uh, worldwide and trying to facilitate it. And this year, the first team from Sub-Saharan Africa that was not South Africa participated from Ghana. So I think that uh, in conclusion, I just want to say that we need governments to be involved in supporting these types of efforts. So for example, if you have these community lab spaces, uh, the government can potentially provide uh, funding, can provide expertise, and maybe um, even a home for these labs, like a f an actual physical space. I think that the government can also um, encourage participation in biotech as a, uh, as a maker activity. I know it sounds a little scary, but uh, it actually can be done quite safely uh, if you define the parameters within which you're making. And iGEM is a great model for that. And I, I also think that uh, people should be aware about how fast this is moving. This area is moving really, really fast. And governments and world organizations really have to pay attention to it and start thinking now about the implications of some of these technologies um, before they actually literally hit the market.